My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big. You're tuned in to Faith City Outreach with Marina Maria, the founder of Global Gospel Worship Radio. Maria interviews local Christian pastors, authors, musicians, and global leaders, sharing their testimonies and the servant work being done for the Lord. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus reminds us to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We hope this program will encourage you to do just that. Now here's your host, Marina Maria. Welcome to Faith City Outreach. This is Marina Maria with today's special guest, Blake Masters, who is an America First Republican and running for election to the U.S. House to represent Arizona's 8th Congressional District. Blake is a conservative, a father, a husband, and an entrepreneur, and a best-selling author. He was endorsed by President Donald Trump in his 2022 race for U.S. Senate. Blake grew up and attended high school in Arizona before graduating from Stanford University and Stanford Law School. He and his wife, Catherine, have four sons. Thank you, Blake, for being on Faith City Outreach today to share how the Lord is going to help you take back our country if elected as congressman. Thanks for having me so much. It's great to be with you here. You're welcome. Blake, I know that you grew up in Tucson, Arizona. Please share your Jesus story. Yeah, sure. Um, we moved to Tucson when I was four. We were uh, in, in Denver, Colorado. So I was born and baptized in, in Denver. And, and my parents had met in Colorado. My mom grew up in in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, in a very Catholic Italian uh, upbringing. My dad went to the Air Force Academy, and so they met there. Took one vacation to Tucson, Arizona, and they just they just loved it, right? So as a four-year-old, I moved there, uh, grew up Catholic, and um, you know, we went to, to um, St. Thomas the Apostle Parish in, in sort of north Tucson foothills. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was a really great upbringing. When I look back on it, I, I took the faith component for granted, you know, because when you're a kid, you, you're not, you're just doing what your parents are, you know, you're in the, in the flow and it was great. And I did Sunday school and all that, but I did, I do think I took it for granted. And, and it's something I've realized now in my adult life, because when I was 12 or so, yeah, I think just before I was a teenager, we sort of just stopped going to mass. We stopped going to church. And there was no good reason for it. We had moved houses, so it was a little bit less convenient to get to church. But, you know, like my sister and I were starting to be high schoolers and busy with all this stuff. And it just, we fell into this sort of bad habit of just not going. And that had the effect, I think, for for at least a decade, maybe. I mean, it depends on how you measure it. But I fell away from the faith for a long time. It's something that... Uh, you know, it's tempting to feel ashamed about it looking back, but you know, it's just, it's just what happened and everyone's got their own story. But when I was a teenager, right, when I was in high school, college, maybe even my early twenties, really before I had children, um, and we'll talk about how children maybe changes your, your perspective, right? I, I was just, I was focused on politics. I was focused on school, right? I would have, uh, would have been that annoying sort of college atheist who was telling you, well, I believe blah, blah. blah no time for God. Right. And, and again, looks foolish in retrospect, but you get a little bit older and kind of realize how much you thought you knew and you really didn't know anything. So I was one of those guys. And, um, I had the great fortune to, to, uh, link up with some people, uh, Peter Thiel, um, you know, became a mentor to me. He's a very famous Silicon Valley investor, uh, very strong Christian and, and some people around him that, that, uh, became really good friends of mine, uh, take their Catholicism. Peter's not Catholic, but, but these friends were, and they took this very seriously in San Francisco, right in Los Angeles. And all of a sudden that started to open up my eyes and it, it made me realize, wow, they have such a deeper faith than I used to. I started learning a lot more about Catholicism. Uh, and then around the same time I had my first child. And when you have a child, you sort of uh, instantly, you know, not even in, in a religious necessarily or theological way, but just even your secular time horizons change. It was no longer about me. All of a sudden we're caring for this baby infant, right? And the more uh, we got immersed in, in building this family, the more I came to realize like, wow, how much was I missing? And I started to feel called back uh, to the faith. And so it's it's taken some time, but even the last two or three years, uh, you know, my, my wife joined the, the Catholic church. She, she had a Christian, but non Catholic upbringing. And so she joined the church. We baptized the kids, uh, just over a year ago, um, the three kids. And then my, my newest just joined, he was just baptized two months ago. And now we can't even, you know, now we're just, we're just members of the body of Christ where we, we, we try to teach the kids like everything 
um, is to glorify God, you know, and, and it's so beautiful and it's so true and it becomes such second nature when you're really trying, we, you know, we fail and we stumble and all, all of that. Uh, but we, but we try. And now that's our orientation as a family, right? That's my job is to lead the family. And now we look back and it's like, man, how lost were we, you know, and you didn't even realize how lost you were. And that's the, it's one of the graces that you get as you get deeper and deeper into the, the mystery of faith. And, and um, I'm rambling a little bit, but that's sort of the, the story. And it's coincided with my uh, efforts in politics. And uh, I got very, very serious about faith when you, when you know, politics is important, but there's also a spiritual warfare develop, you know, uh, element to what we're seeing happen in our country. And um, it was very interesting to, to go through that experience in 2022. I ran for Senate. It was a very hard fought campaign. I knew I was running for, for the right reasons, uh, but, but I lost, you know, I didn't win. I didn't cross the finish line first. And your temptation when something like that happens is to always, you know, um, say like, well, what happened? I was doing the right thing. You know, I was, I was trying to work hard. I was trying to glorify God. Like, why did God let me stumble? Why didn't I person, you know, and uh, it's just been a really interesting process working through that and realizing that everything does happen for a reason. It may not, my human motivations, my human will is, is, is weak and infallible and imperfect, uh, God's is not God, God's in charge. God knows what he's doing. And so this process of surrendering, right. And, 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 uh, I was humbled after that loss, I think in a really important way. And it helped me, I think it just clear about a lot of things. And, and now I'm running and I know that it's, it's like, Lord, let thy will be done. Like I want to win. Hopefully that's the Lord's will, but if it's not, then there's a reason for that. Right. So I think it's do the best you can every day, let God sort out the rest Meantime, I'm going to lead my family, try to lead my community, lead my state and lead my country. And so it's it's all been this beautiful synthesis. Um, that's just my path. I know everyone's looks different. Uh, I sure hope that a lot of people who were as lost uh, as I was, you know, 10 or 12 years ago and don't really realize it, you know, the, the hope is that they find a path back and, and start living for the right reasons because it really is a beautiful thing. So do you think that was the time when the Lord called you into the political arena? I do. Yeah. And, and you know, things... Yeah, I couldn't have predicted it. Um, six years ago, I was just, I was living in California and, uh, you know, doing well in business. And, and that was a, that was a blessing. That was fun. I was interested in politics, but I didn't think that I myself would be running, right. Well, all of a sudden, you know, my boss wanted to move the office out of San Francisco to Los Angeles. My wife and I had two young children at the time. We didn't want to live in Los Angeles. LA can be a fun place to visit, but it seems to me to be one of the worst places to try to raise a, a, a child, right? Especially in a, in a Christian context. It's like the Sunset Strip, but yikes. Yes. Um, so we we got this beautiful opportunity to move back home to Arizona. You know, I met my wife in middle school in Arizona. Her her uh, her parents were there. My, my parents were there. So we got to move back and that just opened up a whole new world for me, right? I got to be uh, networking and politics. I got to meet sort of the the movers and shakers in Arizona politics. And the timing was just interesting. I had a front row seat to watching us lose those two Senate seats, 2018 and 2020. We lost the two Senate seats, which for my whole childhood, right, it was John Kyle and John McCain. These Senate seats were ruby red. Arizona was a red state. You didn't even have to worry about it. Uh, losing these Senate seats. And all of a sudden, yeah. like, what are the, you know, it's not the what are the chances thing. That's too secular a framework. But like, I move home, I have this moment in my career where it makes sense to maybe do something else. Uh, I had just seen us lose two Senate seats. And, and yeah, I just, I, I felt called to do something about it. And so maybe, you know, it was a big lift to just run for Senate when I'd never run for anything before, but it felt like the right thing to do. And I learned so much and uh, I was honored to win the primary and you know, fought as hard as I can, but, uh, but if I, th I think you learn almost more from defeat than you do from victory, like victory is always better and, and all that in some way, you know, but, but my job has been to, to just learn and try to become better and better, right. I'm putting my business career on hold. I'm trying to be a, a, uh, a public servant. Um, and my job is to be the best, uh, public servant I can be right. Just like I was trying to be the best businessman I could be just like I'm trying to be the best father I can be. And it's interesting, right? Like we want to be perfect, right? Be perfect because your heavenly father is perfect. That's a, that's a, a, a command. Um, but it's also interesting because you have to know that, yeah, you try to be perfect, but you will fail. You know, you, you won't be perfect because guess what? Like there was only one perfect person. Exactly. Ever 
And, um, and so dealing with imperfection is very interesting. Right. Uh, and I read this quote very recently, I listened to a podcast on this quote and it was, I think it was, um, if you expect to be perfect before heaven, that's just pride, right? So you should try to be perfect, but you got to know that you're going to fail in advance and know that we're only saved to the grace of, of our Lord. And, uh, it's this interesting tension. You try to do as well as you can, but you also can't be this perfectionist that actually expects to succeed fully because that would be prideful and, and navigating that balance is just a fascinating thing. But I think if you do it right, you just get better and better. You get ever more perfect. You still fall short. And, you know, that's kind of the right balance. I, I really, I really feel that's, that's the ideal. If elected as congressman, what are ways you would defend the Christian faith since we are living in such challenging times where our Christian faith is being uh, attacked? challenged. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is, is just be public and proud about it. Right. Um, I don't care if people ridicule me. Uh, I don't, I don't care what they say, you know, I'll, I'll never deny my faith. I'll always be proud of it. And the hope is by, you know, I mean, I, my job as a congressman, I got to pass the right legislation, you know, blocking and tackling, do the, do the right things. But I also want to, uh, as I'll be in the public light, I want to be a model for other people and say, um, he's proudly living his Christian faith. He's not going to apologize for it. And and, uh, and hopefully that inspires other people to, to do the same, right? Um, I think just being a, a loud and, you know, unapologetic apologist for Christ and being, being that example, I think is really key. Uh, I was just driving in, in Phoenix and I saw a billboard for a casino and you know, had someone relaxing by the pool with cocktails and whatever. And it said, you do you, mm. you do you was the message on this. And it's just, and, and my boys were in the car and uh, you know, we all saw it and I had to flag it for them. I said, look at that, right? Looks, looks harmless. You do you have a good time. You're in the pool at the casino or whatever. But I told them like, remember, we live in this culture where that is the norm. And that is sort of the opposite of what Christ taught, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus' teaching was not, hey, be who, be exactly who you are. Be proud of that. Uh, you do you. You do what you want. No, no, no. It was very much the opposite, right? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And this is subtle. And, and you could read that billboard as not some giant frontal attack on Christianity. But again, I think it is an attack, actually. And, and that's the culture we live in. Um, you could say it's still a majority Christian country. Or whatever, but I think that the culture is not, and the secularization, the the selfishness, the uh, you know, I believe in individual rights politically, of course, but the the cultural individualism where everybody's atomized, and we try to try to just elevate the desires of one individual above above caring about your community. I think all that is is a bad secular trend, and um, I intend to be a loud advocate for for the opposite. Right, and as Christians, we're always going to be fighting against the world view yes. because we're living in the biblical worldview they're right. always yeah, you have to, and they're always clashing it's easy to say hard to do right but we know we have to to be in the world but not of it right. and you if know, you were elected to be a congressman for arizona's eighth congressional district what are the most pressing issues affecting our state yeah i mean the first that comes to mind is the the border crisis the illegal immigration right and you have to remind people there's all sorts of different ways to analyze this there's there's increased crime that comes from this that's obviously bad for the victims of of the crime there's the fentanyl that's coming through um i mean i'm very concerned about drugs in the united states fentanyl is obviously sort of extremely lethal right but even just the cultural um acceptance of of sort of you know maybe less physically harmful but but also harmful drugs whether it's uh, marijuana methamphetamine ketamine like yeah, this stuff is becoming normalized in a way that it's very dangerous. And I think the drug trade over the border, southern border really is hurting a lot of Arizonans, a lot of Americans. Um, but one way I, I like to frame the the border crisis, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis, right? It's not like it's good for the people who are being trafficked up here. Um, maybe they're so desperate in their home country that they feel like they have to pay a you know, Mexican drug cartel coyote thousands of dollars to get in. But but the women and children are horribly abused on the way up here. Uh, many of the men are sold into basically some kind of modern day slavery. Um, you got to remember, there's more slaves in the world now than at any point before in human history, right? Which is not to justify or, or defend anything in the past. It's just to say, like, it's now a current problem, too. And a lot of that slave trade, the modern slave trade, is, is happening right at our southern border with Mexico. Um, and look, I think it's the Democrats' fault. I, I think Joe Biden basically like surrendered our sovereignty and reversed many good policies 
and it's it's just the wild west at the border, right? So many Arizonans are feeling that and, and getting some border security, getting a reasonable immigration mm -hmm. system in place where we're not just tolerating millions of people, many of whom intend us harm, right? Many, how many Hamas terrorists, you know, Muslim jihadis are we letting in? That's number one. Uh, a close second would be the economy and inflation. And, you know, it's, it's, they promised us a few years ago, oh, this inflation is temporary. It's transitory. Here's these, no, it's here to stay under Joe Biden. And we get hit hardest uh, in, in Metro Phoenix. I think maybe it's cooled down a little bit from 14% to 12%. So they say inflation's falling and it's like, no, 12% is still really high, right? It still means that the groceries, uh, your rent, everything you need to live is getting more and more expensive. Meanwhile, we're not seeing any wage growth. So people are making the same or less money and everything is costing more and more. That's a problem, right? So getting a healthy economy where you can actually afford to raise a family uh, and, and getting some border security so we can just live safely. Uh, those are my two top priorities. And um, God decides when life begins and when and how it ends, Blake. I read that in 2022, you changed your views about abortion. What are your current views about abortion now? Well, uh, I have to push back on the premise. So I, I did not change my views. I, okay. I maybe try to talk about things in a different way, switching from the primary election to the general election context. Mm -hmm. um, and political enemies zoom in on that and they say, oh, Blake's flip-flopping. No, I believe in life, right? I, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Catholic. I believe in the teachings of the church. Um, and to me, that is correct. Life is worth defending. And we live in this culture where I, I've said that I, abortion to the left is is their religious sacrament. Uh, it's really sad. I, I got in trouble in 2022 in the general election because I said it was demonic. Um, but I, I think it is, you know. And I, look, I think we can sympathize with with uh, women, especially young women, poorer women in, in tough spots, right? They're told my body, my choice for years and years. And there's an abortion industry that's sort of pushing this stuff on them. And some people have come to feel, feel like this is their only choice. And I think that's a crime. That's a really sad thing for the culture to do to young women. And so one thing I want to do is, uh, you know, get more resources to crisis pregnancy centers. You know, I've gotten to tour a lot of these facilities in Arizona um, to let women know there's other choices, right? Mm -hmm. Uh if you if you really can't take care of a child, um, adoption adoption is great. Like what better gift than to give a child a chance at life, right? And I, I do think abortion is the intentional destruction of human life of the unborn. And so I'm I'm never going to be for that. You could debate politically how much could you get done, um, you know, which I've come out in favor of a, a federal backstop. Right. All at the state level, I'll vote for legislators who are maximally pro life. Uh, and I think the effect of the Dobbs decision was to give give that you know, legislative making power back to the states. Uh, but I do think, I don't think that's enough. I think we need a federal backstop uh, where we don't let California, we don't let Oregon pass laws that say you can just basically execute a baby at, at eight months. Like it's ridiculous. And to me, the constitution, you know, it, the 14th amendment, it protects life, liberty, property. You can't deprive people of those without due process, right? Well, it's hard to imagine a greater deprivation of liberty or life than just uh, uh, killing a baby in the womb. So I'll stand for life at the federal level, I'll back a 15 week, uh, uh, you know, protective law. And, and then you sort of let the pro-life movement continue in the States where I'll continue to be a strong supporter of that. So I think that was, um, that was where I was in 2022. It's where I am and it's where I always will be. Are you agreeing? that there is that you will allow or you agree to allow abortion to happen at a certain week like you said 15 weeks well, no I wouldn't I, that's the wrong way to look at it no, I believe oh, life okay. starts. I believe life so starts you just don't happen. agree with it at all what I'm saying is the I, right now at the federal level there's no protections at all right right and my political judgment is I think in the next five or ten years maybe you could get a 15 week law passed right? If you just advocate for a full federal ban, that's just, that's never going to pass. However much you might like it, or I might like it, right? Uh, I think 15 weeks at the federal level is what you could actually get done in the next five to 10 years. And politics is the art of the possible, right? So without ever compromising on the principle, I'm trying to get something positive done so we can actually save lives, right? But what we really also need to do at the same time is promote this culture of life. Right now, there's a culture of death, right? Right now, young women are growing up in this me, 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 you do you, right? This culture that says that the child in the womb is somehow not a human being, but to me, it obviously is. And I think we need to be persuasive on that. We need to win hearts and minds. We need to, to shower those crisis pregnancy centers with love and attention and resources and let everyone know there's a different choice. 
right? Ultimately, if you live in a culture of death, people are going to choose that. We need to rebuild this culture of life. And to me, that's sharing the teachings of of the church, right? And how beautiful life is. And again, this is something that your perspective shifts on. I think once you had children, um, I look at my children, I remember my, uh, we had a home birth for our last two, um, sort of the babies born after COVID, we chose to do home birth. It was a really beautiful experience and something I recommend people looking into, but I remember catching my my baby boy was born in 2020. And you know, you have the rush of emotions and, and it's, it's just elation and joy. But I remember maybe 20 or 30 minutes later holding this little guy and I started to think this political thought, which is like, how crazy is it that the modern left and the modern culture really would say an hour ago when that baby was still inside his mother, that that he had, he had no rights, that he had no moral right to live. And it's really sinister. And again, I think it's it's demonic and we have to fight back against that culture of death and build a culture of life. Absolutely. Because um, practicing Christians will agree that God decides when life begins and when it ends. And they would not agree to any term of aborting a child. Yeah, it's never, it's, uh, look, I think it's never the right choice. And it doesn't mean you, you don't have any sympathy for people in, in tough spots, but like, I don't think that's ever the right choice. There's a lot of better choices and let's help people do that. Right. Um, it, there's a similar debate happening. And to me, there should be no debate at all on the right. other side of the mm-hmm. life spectrum, right? Look at what mm-hmm. Canada is doing. Look at what so many of the European countries are doing with assisted suicide, mm-hmm. you know, youth in Asia. And I don't believe in that. Like, and obviously the church teaches, like, it's fine to give pain medication and stuff like this. Um, but it's never fine for, uh, for, for doctors or for some government or medical establishment, uh, to help people kill themselves or to, to make a decision to terminate, uh, someone's, someone's life unnaturally. Like it's the opposite of what medicine is supposed to do, by the way, the first principle in medicine is do no harm. Well, if you kill someone like that's, that, that, that's, that's not a, a human decision to make. Um, and so this assisted suicide, this euthanasia, again, it's just the other side of the abortion spectrum, but we live in a culture of death. And so it's not surprising to me that in that culture, the left is actually probably gaining ground uh, on, on both ends. And that's just obviously not a healthy culture, right? A healthy culture does not encourage uh, women to kill their babies. And it does not encourage people to kill, you know, uh, elderly folks or people even with terminal diseases, right? Have compassion, have sympathy, um, get people resources. Let's take care of each other. Let's not kill each other. Right. This, this should be common sense. But in today, that's it's everything's turned upside down and it's yeah. not. We have to write the, the culture and I'm going to work on that in Congress. What is one thing you value about representing the Republican Party? Well, we have a tremendous opportunity here to rebuild the party. You know, mm-hmm. the Republican Party is still doing some soul searching. A lot of people, um, or at least a plurality in the party, want to take it back to mm-hmm. the day, you know, 2006, George W. Bush, Paul Ryanism. And, you know, those guys, I think we're wrong about a lot of key stuff. Um, I think the modern Republican Party, at least in the mold of President Trump, is much more skeptical about starting wars. Right. It's too easy to say, well, we need to defend ourselves by just starting this war and taking care of this. And, t- and and the goal of the United States government should not be to be the world's policeman. You know, there are, are other conflicts in other countries with other interests that that we don't have to go and police or fight all the time. I'm really worried about the war in Ukraine, for instance, um, actually kind of getting out of hand and spinning into World War Three. And so I don't think we should continue to send $80 billion a quarter or whatever it is to Zelensky. I just don't think we should be doing that. And and uh, this opportunity to continue to help mold the party in that, in that, I'd say, Trumpian America first direction is really important. There's the foreign policy version, there's a the trade version, mm-hmm. where for a long time, um, the Republicans were just sort of mindlessly free trade. And you know, I probably was too, frankly. And and President Trump, I think, came and reset that conversation. Maybe free trade is is a good general rule, but there's no such thing as free trade with China, right? Because China is a t- communist totalitarian mm-hmm. dictatorship. They're always putting their thumb on the scale, subsidizing domestic industry, dumping steel, right? Uh, devaluing currency. They don't play fair. And so you need protective tariffs in order to ensure that they play fair and to ensure that there's some fairness. Otherwise, we're just shipping jobs to China and helping China industrialize. And they're a real geopolitical rival, right, if not an enemy. So I think updating the party, right, there's some values are obviously timeless. Uh, I think protecting life is a timeless value. I think life, liberty, the pursuit of you know happiness, timeless values encoded into our founding documents. Um, but some things like, does it make sense to have 
uh, more immigration or less immigration, right? Does it make sense to have more free trade with Southeast Asia or should we have some tariffs? These things can change decade over decade, depending on what's going on. And I think President Trump is leading us sort of in the right direction on those things and other Republicans that maybe pine for the good old days that, that you know, maybe weren't so good after all in retrospect. Um, I think they want to lead us down the right path. So to be a young leader in Congress and support that Trump agenda and support this rebuilding of the Republican Party to actually maximize the value of each, indiv uh, each individual American citizenship, um, which I think should be our goal. That's just a very exciting moment in time. And, and I'm thrilled to get a chance to play a, a part of it. What is something that you would like people to know about you personally that perhaps maybe you've never shared before in an interview? It's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I will say that I, I think uh, I do think most of the media is very unhealthy at this point. So I think if you get most of your news from the media, if you let mm -hmm. the editors at the New York Times, you know, twist the headline and, and you're just going to you're going to get a very misleading impression of not just me, but most Republicans. Right. President mm -hmm. Trump. Um, and so, again, it's not just about me. Um, it's especially not about me. But I, I hope that most people, especially people in the middle politically, who are going to decide who the next president is. Right. My wish is that people really start realizing, hey, things are bad. And the establishment is telling us things are really good. And this doesn't add up and mm -hmm. and just develop and, and follow that curiosity. Go and, and read. Like if someone uh, even if they don't like my politics or even if they prefer one of my opponents, but if someone listens to this conversation that you and I are having, you know, my hope is that they would come away saying, hey, Blake's a real guy, you know, and he he struggles with this and he he's trying to prioritize this and he's trying to lead his family in this way. And and that's relatable. And it's re and it's different from the attack ads. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not the guy that The New York Times, you know, hit piece said he was. And this isn't yeah. just true of me. It's true of most people out there in the political arena. Most of them are are flawed people. We all are actually, right? But they're trying to do good. Mm -hmm. And uh, if people see the human behind uh, a lot of these headlines, I think that would be net healthy for our politics in general. How can more people learn about your issues um, that you're working towards, Blake? And um, and I know you have a website. Is it blakemasters.com? That's it. Very simple. Okay. It's just blakemasters.com. Mm -hmm. We lay out for what I stand for and why I'm running. Okay. Uh, there's ways to volunteer and, and, and you know, support the campaign and, and all that good stuff. So yeah, BlakeMasters.com. Thank you, Blake, for being on Faith City Outreach today. And may God continue to bless you and your family and the work that you're doing that he has called you to do. And may God's perfect will be done in your upcoming election. God is the one that chooses the leaders in government and in everywhere around the country. So may God's perfect will be done. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Global Gospel Worship Radio with Marina Maria, where all the nations praise the Lord with Christian international music and radio programs. We'd like to thank our major financial sponsors, Spectrum Insurance and Financial Group, for supporting our program, as well as our other media partners who make the broadcast of this show possible. If you'd like to donate to our radio ministry or to learn more about it, please go to globalgospelworshipradio.org. And finally, we hope you'll go with this blessing from Psalm 2911. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Thanks for listening. Yes, my God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God